absorbed in, you know, start absorbing into it, and everything else disappears, you feel like you're losing control of your individuality? I've never had a problem with that. But I know what you're talking about because uh, I, I have experienced or heard stories of people who started to catch a glimpse of that and they immediately just pull themselves back because it's a scary thing to lose that small sense of self. Yeah. But again, this is why it, it comes down to a sense of trust, I suppose, <laughs> because you're going to come back. Mm -hmm. So as long as you are alive, it's important to realize that by doing, as long as your body is alive, that by doing um, these meditation techniques, you're learning to kind of go through that fear to exist in that state so you know what you are. That way, when, um, when you're done and your body's done, then it's you just go because you don't have that kind of fear. And that's a lot of what uh, you know, the, the yoga of immortality is all about. It's recognizing that so that you realize that as you move through these states of consciousness that you still exist as that that core so my experiences has been with that is not necessarily a fear it's more of a oh look at that and then as soon as I would say that or feel that it would go away mm -hmm. so it always comes down whether it's fear or whether it's oh there it is uh, you know some kind of intense curiosity it doesn't matter it, it, it does the exact same thing it stops the process it's all about whatever starts to come up for you just try to breathe and just try to do your best to let go, staying with it, and in a sense, inviting it. And um, yeah, then it becomes comfortable for you. So, so have you ex have you had this experience then? Yeah, I, you even mentioned in one of your videos how you said you always just kind of be cool yeah. and during the whole thing, and that's that helps me. But I don't have it consistently enough. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. You can though, and that's a very good point. This gets consistent. You, you have to make it a priority to try every day to do it. Um, for me, what I have to do is I have checklists. I'm a big fan of checklists. And if I notice something like this that I absolutely know is important to work on, I will write it at the top of my checklist every day. And even if I don't want to do it, even if it doesn't work, or I know it's not going to work, I try anyway. And then that makes it more consistent. So just keep going for it. The way that you get into it is, and, and again, this is the hard part, but this is where it requires kind of the subtlety of your attention, your awareness. Try to keep your awareness here. And then when you hear it, you ask, your, you ask yourself, or I ask myself when I'm getting into it, okay, what is behind this sound? Or what is beneath this sound? And it's like as though you're trying to s strain a little bit to listen a little bit deeper. Like when you're sitting here now, and you can hear me talking, and you can hear the air conditioning running. And so that's what you hear. But if you listen a little harder, you can hear the crickets outside. And behind that, you can hear someone mowing grass. And behind that, really faint, you can hear some other little insects. So it's sort of that kind of process where you first listen to what you can hear and then you try your best to listen to what is behind it or what is below it. And if you have a hard time um, wherever you're meditating, again, try earplugs because you'll hear it louder and then you can just really try to go a little bit deeper into it. And then what happens is you'll start to get the, the taste of it, the feel for it, the hang of it, and you'll hear maybe like instead of that high pitch sound, you'll start to hear like a, a lower pitched wobble, like, like something like that. And it's faint and it comes and it goes, and you listen a little bit deeper, and then you hear maybe like a, a, a rush of maybe the sounds of like a swarm of bees or something of that nature. But it, And it will come and it will go because your attention is kind of alternating between depth here. But if you keep trying and keep going, eventually what happens, at least has been my experience, is it, it does turn into like the roar of an ocean. And it's not, you don't, there's no mistaking it. You, you actually hear that. So keep in mind that it's not necessarily that easy. It's very subtle. And it does require you to try, like really dig in while trying to be relaxed. <laughs> too much attention to it because then it goes away. Exactly. I've gotten to the bees uh -huh. stage, so that's uh, interesting to know that that's kind of a progression. 
Right. So try to make it, try to be interested in it okay. in the sense of what you're learning to do is not an easy thing. So if you know that from the very beginning and you're you, in, and you, as I've said before, in many of the talks with the Kriya Yoga Apprenticeship Program, um, you have to figure out how it works for you. Because the way I'm describing it, that's how it worked for me. And that, that, that was me sitting down and remembering things that Mr. Davis said and trying them out. Some of them worked for me, some of them didn't, and I, and I had to feel my way through it myself. So it'll be different for everybody, but you've got a great space here this week to work on it. Yeah. There was another thing that both of you mentioned that was important. Oh, um, the idea, the sense of uh, like dying, like you're, there's a fear of dying. And that makes sense because you're used to working through in this life uh, through your mind and through your personality. And so when you are, to be able to hear and experience these things, you have to let go of your mind and your personality. And that's scary for the mind and the personality. But the reason I bring this up is because there's a reason um, I put that book together, Kriya Yoga Vichara, Vichara Self-Inquiry, because when you get to that point and you feel that sense of fear or that sense of I am, I'm, I'm dying and this is scary, what you can do there, if you can't go any further, is to back up and then do some vichara. Feel the experience and then ask, what is what am I that feels like I am dying? What am I that feels this fear? And if you hang on to that and you dive into that with, again, the same kind of subtlety, eventually these things kind of just, it's almost like they break apart and that fear falls away and you realize that that's not necessarily something so important. So that's another way of negotiating this path, negotiating this process, because too often um, Kriya Yoga and any kind of meditation is really taught like it is a mechanical thing where if you just go in and you, you know, you add the right amount of sugar, the right amount of flour, the right amount of raisins, the right temperature, you've got it perfect. But we're not baking here. We are, in a sense, doing, um, we are learning to kind of cook on the fly. And so, when you are engaged in the process, you have to be attentive to what is it you need to be doing now. Is it, okay, I hear the sound, so I need to really listen behind it and listen behind it. I got distracted, now I'm back up again. Keep going. And then finally you get to the point to where you're very deep in the process, but then you're like, wait a minute, this is scary. I'm losing my sense of self. So now do you continue to try to listen to the sound? Well, maybe keep that up a little bit. But if it persists, the sense of fear or the sense of what's going on here, then you need to adapt and pull back and say, all right, well, what is, what, what feels this? What is aware of this? What has this sensation? Then you move into vichara until that becomes evident to you that you're okay. And then you go back to listening to the sound again. Okay, this is... Um, this is, this is where your meditation process, your meditation life becomes alive, okay? So many of us in the beginning, what we do is we do our um, life force arousal technique, we do our Kriya Pranayama, we do our Jyoti Mudra, and we sit there. <sighs> okay, 30 minutes go by, we get up, we do our thing. And that's good, that's excellent training to teach us how to internalize our awareness, but once you've got that under control, you have to engage the process. You have to get in there and as though you are having a conversation with yourself, as though you are interacting, having uh, a very dynamic experience, you engage it, and that's where you have the, the profound breakthroughs in your meditation. That's where um, the saints and the sages, that's how they learned, understood, and knew what they did, not by hypnotizing themselves through meditation techniques, but by using those as... Uh, tools so that they could access those deeper states of awareness and work through whatever was going on for them. Does this make sense, what I'm trying to say? Good. Sorry, can I just ask one more question? Sure. So when I also say it like, feels like I'm dying, I also mean like there's like a physical reaction. Like my body goes like completely rigid and I'm, I don't know. It just feels like, like my, I like literally like feel my heart like almost stop. Mm -hmm. and it, it just kind of go like, kind of radiates like cool, like cold. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I think that's what freaks me out. It's like almost the physical component, and I come out of it, and I'm just like, 
why am I like, <laughs> like literally like flexing every ounce of my body? But it's okay because that's that. I realize I realize it's a it's a scary thing. But remember, I mean, maybe you know, maybe you don't. Um, uh, the story of Ramana Maharshi and the process he went through. Again, I don't have it memorized verbatim, but from what I understand, it seemed like he had come home one day and all of a sudden had this extreme fear of, of death and fear of dying. And what he did was, is he laid down and he imagined that he was going through the whole process, like his body went rigid and stiff, and he was no longer uh, attached to that body. And he even, in his mind, could visualize and see his body going to the, the burning grounds and these sorts of things. So this, when that happens to you, that is a opportunity to feel your way through it. And again, the thing I would advise is going back to this idea of vichara, of when you feel it, if just stay with the feeling, try however you can to welcome the feeling and, and ask as though you really want to know, as though you really mean it, what is experiencing this? What is experiencing this? And what you may find is that it's the, the, the fear, the sensation may persist for a bit, but if you can be okay, comfortable with it, then something happens. It's as though it breaks apart, or it's as though it is experienced like it is a gift of some sort. And then from that comes a type of realization. And I think this is true for... Um, Many of the things that you experience in life that you don't consider to be pleasant. <laughs> um, it's easy to think that we want our lives to be perfect all the time and that by practicing Kriya Yoga and spirituality that will always be the case, nothing will go wrong, but that's not the case. So what we're learning is that every experience we have, <clears throat> everything that is presented to us is an aspect of this divine consciousness. And even if it's uncomfortable, if we can take a moment to step back and this is the way I do it, at least right now. Step back and when you feel something that you don't want to feel or doesn't seem quite right in this world, and you ask, okay, what is this, what is, what is this gift that I am being given? What is this gift that I am being given? And then the emotion or the feeling or the sensation may change, alter, it may intensify, it may grow more intense, but if you can use your Kriya Yoga training to stay poised, alert and watchful and feeling, not resisting, but just feeling, experiencing, observing, and ask, what is this gift that I am being given? Usually, so far, some clarity or realization or understanding or uh, openness or sense of freedom comes from that. And that is also part of the, the Kriya Yoga process. It's not just being here, cranking out Kriyas. It's about as you move through your life, finding a way to acknowledge and accept and surrender to whatever is being given to you, whatever that is, joy, sadness, sorrow, happiness, whatever it might be. And that's one of the reasons why um, in the Yoga Sutras, so if you don't have this book, this is The Science of Self-Realization, which is um, written by Mr. Davis, and it has a commentary, at least it used to, let's make sure it still does, um, commentary on the Yoga Sutras, and in chapter 2 of the Yoga Sutras, um, it's described what intensive spiritual practice is. So chapter 2 of the Yoga Sutras is called Kriya Yoga, which indicates intensive spiritual practice. And the very first sutra in chapter 2 is intensive self-discipline, studious self-inquiry, and surrender to God are the practices of Kriya Yoga. So intensive self-discipline, studious self-inquiry, and surrender to God are the practices of Kriya Yoga. And this is, we've already talked about this, this has been the topic so far. The intensive self-discipline is that ability to train yourself to be as alert yet calm as possible on a regular schedule. The studious self-inquiry, that is exploring what you are, 
but it is also being engaged in your meditation practice such that when you need to make a shift or an adjustment or shift gears due to whatever is going on in your consciousness, you do. That's part of studious self-inquiry. It's paying attention to what's actually going on for you in yourself. And then the third one, surrender to God. These are the practices of Kriya Yoga. That is, surrender to God. <clears throat> we make it sound often, or many people do, that when we surrender to God, again, all goes well. Well, in the bigger picture, the absolute scheme of things, all does go well. Related to our personality, our body, the little plans that we make, sometimes they don't work out. But this idea of surrender to God is learning to interpret, to understand, to welcome that no matter what happens, that this is part of something greater than our little mind can comprehend. And that's why whenever something does happen that makes us uncomfortable or doesn't go our way, rather than fight it, rather than to get angry, rather than to say this shouldn't happen, what we do is we feel whatever that situation is, we reflect upon it, and we ask either one the way I do it is, what is, the, what is this gift? Even though I don't understand it, it doesn't seem like a gift at all, what is it? Or you ask, what, what am I supposed to, how, how am I supposed to interact with this? What am I supposed to do here in this situation? And inspirations arise when you sincerely think about, intend for this process to occur. Something comes up, you need to respond, you reflect, what am I to do? You follow that inspiration. You don't know what's going to happen if you follow that inspiration but you do, that's surrendering to the process. And you continue living your life that way, one foot in front of the other, to see where it is leading. It may lead to where you want it to go. It's possible. It may lead you somewhere totally different. But what you often find is wherever you end up, you think, okay, that's okay. I, 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 can, I can handle that. <laughs> so when you think about the Kriya Yoga process, it all comes down to these three things self-discipline, to stay on track, to stay on course with what you're committed to. Self-inquiry, paying attention to how you need to manage your mental, emotional, and physical states on a more gross level, but also what, what are you, the literal self-inquiry, what are you that is experiencing this, that is not the mind, that is not the personality, that is not the history, but is flowing through that? And then finally, surrender to God. And surrender to God in your meditation practice, that can be where you've done your absolute best. You sit down, you meditate, you've gone through the Kriya processes, you've done your self-inquiry, you've, you've breathed, you've become conscious, and now you just let go. And what I have found is that in those instances of letting go, when you're not trying to do anything anymore, yet you are staying awake, attentive, yet relaxed, it's in those moments that two things happen. You may sense that you are becoming more distracted because some kind of random thoughts or imaginations or physical sensations just seem to come out of nowhere. That's one thing that can happen. But if you're able to simply sit and observe what is happening there, as whatever those, some scars are, whatever those karmic imprints are that you have not been able to attend to through will or right living or whatever it might be, they're being dissolved by coming up into your awareness. What most people do is they freak out there, and then they try to fight it or push it down or do something else. And therefore they, in a sense, prevent themselves from releasing or dissolving whatever those karmas may be. So as long as you can simply stay surrendered, let it go, let it breathe, they will stop. And then if you stay with it long enough, you will experience that state of thought-free existence being. Now, the second thing that occurs is that you don't go through that experience and you immediately have an awareness of not being anything in particular, 
just existing as though you are a point free in space. And from there, who knows what's going to happen, <laughs> but from there, that's when uh, higher realizations tend to naturally come to you, to naturally dawn. The key is not to crave them. The key is to simply hold your awareness, sit, wait, and let the process happen as it will.